Uh, Ted wrote that last verse of that, that song you just sang, by the way, in case you didn't know that. And uh, that last verse got me in a lot of trouble. So thank you, Ted. Take your Bible and turn with me. <laughs> Take your Bible and turn with me, Phil, to Ecclesiastes chapter number 25. Ecclesiastes chapter number 25. And uh, I'll just, while you're turning there, there's a, we have some book, I brought a couple of books on, on the book table over there. We, uh, a commentary in the book of Daniel that uh, we just put out is, is there. Uh, there are a couple of other books. One is on, uh, the title is Tulip. One of the most uh, dangerous doctrines that, have, that, that came out of the, the Protestant Reformation is the popularization of a thing called Calvinism. And it is a completely uh, diametrically opposed view of the Word of God as the way, the way Paul tells you to study the Bible. It's a dangerous doctrine. It's also one of the most popular doctrines in, in, in American history, American Christianity. And uh, that little book is just a small little book, but it'll, it gives you a, a real clear explanation of what, what's wrong with it and, and what, what the Bible view is. That's there. There's another little book there about dispensationalism, and, and that's, that's sort of a history book. The Protestant Reformation came out of Catholicism and the, the guy, the reformers that did that, you hear about the reformers, they, they only took one step. They didn't continue on with, with, with recovering of truth and consequently, had they done that, they, they would have gotten to where, where we are today with the dispensational study. And that's a real clear little, little it's easy reading uh, explanation about where history and the, the reformers failed us by not continuing on in the recovery of truth. They, they, they recover justification by faith, but that isn't the, all of the truth there is to recover. And so those books are there, and I'll tell you about that. There's also a little pamphlet about our summer Bible conference. If you enjoy this conference for the weekend, we do a whole week of this in, in July in, in Chicago. If you can stand Ohio, you can stand Chicago for a week. And uh, a number of you, you know, I, you, li you live in this area, and I comm commiserate with you. I understand what it is. I live in Chicago land. So I, I have a little bit of understanding about how the so social things are. But we invite you to come to those things. There's nothing in the world more, and by the way, I didn't bring any, any audio or video material this year for two reasons. One, all of our audio and video materials on the web internet uh, available uh, actually for free. And most people now, CDs and DVDs are you know, things of the past. You old folks know that, younger people. If you're you know, 30 or younger, you don't, don't know what a DVD is. My granddaughter's in college, and she said, Grandpa, do you have something that will play a DVD? <laughs> I said, your computer won't. She said, no, uh, you, you could play them on a computer? You know, she didn't know what a DVD is. And, and one of her classes, they, they gave her a DVD for an exam. I think, I think the final exam was to see if she could play the DVD. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Now we're riding out here on, our, on, on the, the, the car radio, and my wife's got a, her phone in the back, and we listen to books on tape, you know, the books on, not on tape, but anymore, but uh, on, on uh, Audible. And she's sitting in the back, and she hooks it up, and she wants to hook it up to the car radio. I fortunately had my grandson sitting in the front seat, and he knew how to do it. Because, you know, I, I can't do it myself. I, I, it takes me 10 minutes to figure out where the button is. And he just did it sort of naturally. You know, young people, the, the media stuff is, is so much different and their understanding of it, and we appreciate that. But th my point was I didn't bring the other stuff because we brought our grandkids. <laughs> and I brought four grandsons with me. Three of them are bigger than I am, and uh, they're teenagers, and they wanted to come to the Bible conference, and their parents couldn't come. So grandkids are God's reward for not killing your kids. <laughs> so hang on, there is a reward sooner or later. But what you discover is grandmother considers grandkids more of a priority than anything else, <laughs> including God. And so when well, they wanted to come, here they are. So we praise the Lord for that. And the, the other stuff is available otherwise. I want to look with you something in, in, in Ezekiel 25. And what I'd like to do is, and I gave Edward, he asked, he asked some months ago for titles and stuff, and I, I don't know he, he put them up or anywhere. I'm not going to do what I gave him the titles about, but it'll be something similar. It'll be something that, that will be in line with that. But actually, Brother Matt taught some things earlier that, that's going to save me about a half an hour worth of teaching. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like you to understand, when you understand right division, 
and you understand where we are in the dispensation of grace as opposed to prophecy and, and, and the but now instead of time past. And what that chart does is takes Ephesians chapter 2, which is the Apostle Paul's a viewpoint of how to understand how, how God's program is laid out. It's not something that, that I developed or, or that I discovered or that, that I invented. It's, what, it's, it's just taking it and doing it Paul's way. My whole ministry, the, the whole thought of my ministry from the very beginning is if, if, he, what, if Paul's my apostle and I'm to follow Jesus Christ the way he followed Christ, then I need to know what Paul said. And if I can do it Paul's way, I'm doing it the way God tells me to do it. And so if you want to rightly divide, Paul says rightly divide, ask Paul how to do it. He tells you. If you want to do the work of the ministry, ask Paul how to do it. He tells you what the work of the ministry is about. Brother Matt's talking about that earlier. And each of those kind of things is important. And when you understand where we are, sometimes what happens is that you, you think that the only thing that you need to know about is Romans to Philemon. All you need to know about what God's doing today. Well, that's what you need to know, know about what God's doing today so you can know what to do. But you don't want to just jettison the rest of the Bible. Because the rest of the Bible is going to give you an understanding about what's going on out there in the world. Paul is the apostle of Gentiles. This is an age when God has set the nation Israel aside and dealing with the nations here, and he has, has a message for the nations. Then you need to understand something about how the nations operate. You need to understand something about what's going on out there. In the, and for you to understand what's happening in the culture that you live in, is, it, it, is, it, it has, has, a, has its roots in understanding some things about uh, the prophetic program and what's going on in, in, in the overall program of God. And there's a lot of answers for a lot of what's going on to, in, in the world today when you understand some things about the prophetic program. And I'd like to just spend a little bit of time with you this morning and tomorrow talking about uh, some things in, 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 in the prophetic program, in, in the way the nations operate and that, that kind of can give you some ability to function as a believer today in the context of the world we live in. And it's, it's, I'm teaching Ezekiel on Wednesday night in our assembly, and I, I, the last two weeks we've gone through, we got to Ezekiel 25, which is a, a uh, there's a shift in the book of Ezekiel. The first 24 chapters, first three chapters, Ezekiel's given his call, his commission, what his ministry is going to be about. Then from chapter 4 to 24, he talks about the nation Israel. And he's telling them Ezekiel had been taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you remember all this Bible, Bible history, right? Well, I got an exciting response. <laughs> <laughs> Israel's carried away into captivity. They've been in the land. And God told them, if you don't keep, you, you keep my law, you keep my, you keep my covenant, I'll bless you, and you, you'll, you'll be the head of the nations. If you don't, I'm going to chastise you. I'm going to correct you. And so I'm going to put you through it. Leviticus 26, there are five courses of, of, of chastisement, correction. The fifth one, if you haven't learned so far, the fifth one is I'm going to send you off into captivity. I'm going to quit treating you special like you are. I'm going to put you out there among the nations and see what it's like. You want to be like them, I'll put you out there among them. So when you come to the book of Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the, the writing prophets, in that fifth course, he's not going to talk to them. He said, I'm going to put you out there. I don't talk to the Gentiles. I don't talk to you. So he writes them some books. That's why Isaiah to Malachi is in your Bible the way it is. You know, Ezekiel, uh, would, would you like Elijah to have written a book? Would you like to have heard what he had to say? He didn't write a book. All these great prophets in the Old Testament don't write books until you get to Isaiah to Malachi. That's because they were there talking. Now I'm not going to talk, so I'm going to write it down for you. And Isaiah 30, he says, I can go write it in a book, note it in a tape. Write it in a tape, note it in a book, that it might be for the generations to come. So he's going to preserve it and write it for them. So when you come to these prophets, you're at a point where God is sending Israel out into captivity. Daniel tells you how long they're going to be there and what the Gentile nation is going to be like. Ezekiel 4 to 24 tells Israel over and over and over. He's in captivity, and they're thinking, the people on the land, they're okay, we're over here. And he's talking to the to the to, to the uh, to Israel in Babylon, and he's saying, you know what's happening back there? They're getting their clock cleaned, and you know why? And he explains to them, and some of the most graphic borders on pornography, right? pornographic language used in chapter 16 and 23, describing the vileness of Baal worship, the violence that Israel had gotten involved in worshiping the gods of the Gentiles. 
instead of the God of Israel. And he said, the reason you're going to go into captivity is because you want their gods to be your God, so here's what it's going to be like to have God be your God. Now, once that's happened, in chapter 24 of Ezekiel, he says, this day, Jerusalem's fallen. That day. Now, they're over in captivity. It's three years later in chapter 33 before anybody ever gets word to them that it actually happened. They didn't have internet. They didn't have telephones. They didn't, you know, the three fastest form of communication used to be telephone, telegraph, telewoman. <laughs> they didn't have any of that. And it took some time when a captive in chapter 33, he finally gets there and says, hey, it happened, but three years before that almost, that's why Ezekiel dates these things, and I can't remember exact dates in my mind. That's why he, during that period of time, so between chapter 24, when he tells them today, Jerusalem has fallen, and they get the, they get the message, uh, the personal report of it in chapter 33, between that, he's got chapter 25 to 33, where he talks about the Gentile nation. And what he's doing when he talks about these Gentile nations is he, he's, he's, Ezekiel doesn't talk to them, he talks about them. Here's what God's saying to them. And he lists seven nations that surround Jerusalem, that surround Israel. And in essence, what he says to them is, you guys are having a great time. You're, you're, you're excited to watch Israel fall because you think that means that your gods have beaten the God of Israel. But it ain't so. And he's going to tell them, the God of Israel hadn't lost. Your God hadn't won. I'm just, I'm just correcting my children. And when I get them right, I'm going to come get you. Amen. You remember 1 Peter 4, he says, judgment begins in the house of God. Now, in Ezekiel 25, and th th this chapter is, I've been teaching Ezekiel the 41st lesson. I've taught chapter 25. I made, I made a commitment I was going to try to teach eat one chapter a week. You know how hard that is, for me anyway. It's hard for me to teach one verse a week. But if you get the flow of it. When you get to chapter 25, he's going to start talking to these Gentile nations. And, and he's going to talk about four of them. Three of them are Israel's cousins. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them. If you look at verse number 8, it's the Moabites. You, know who, you remember who the Ammonites and the Moabites are, don't you? Lot's kids. Lot's grandkids. He, had, he gets delivered out of Egypt. Out of Egypt. Out of Sodom. Takes his two girls with him. They go out in the cave in the hill. And his two girls commit incest with their daddy to have kids. The Ammonites and the Moabites. So these are Israel's cousins. But they hate Israel. Verse number three, say unto the Ammonites, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God, because thou sayest, aha, against my, my sanctuary, when it was profaned, and against the land of Israel, and the house of Judah, when they went into captivity. He said, you saw the land, my sanctuary, the, the temple, and my people, and you saw them going to captivity, destroyed, and you go, hoo hoo, hot dog, look at, aha, verse six. Thus saith the Lord God, because thou clapped thy hands and stamped thy feet and rejoiced in, in heart with all thy despite against the land of Israel. They hated Israel. And when they saw the Gentiles come in, they go, hoo, hoo, ha, oh, it's like a football rally. Having a pep rally. Excited to see Israel fall because they think they're winning. And it's because of the, the despite. They despised, they hated Israel. The Moabites, same thing. Verse 8, Thus saith the Lord God, because the Moabites and, and Seir do say, Behold, the house of Judah is like unto all the heathen. They're nothing special. They thought they were special. They didn't have special look out. they just like everybody else. Verse 12, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, the Edomites. You remember who Edom is? That's the, the descendants of Esau. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Remember Jake had a brother? All you Bible students, you're supposed to be going like this. Esau. The Edomites have dealt against the house of Judah and taken vengeance and have greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. The Edomites hated Israel. 
took vengeance on them. Tried to get even with them. They see them fall, they go, hot dog, we're winning. Verse 15, thus saith the Lord God, behold the Philistines. Now the Philistines aren't related to Israel. The Philistines, you, you remember one Philistine, don't you? Goliath. They were, they were, they were bad dudes. Now, that's an interesting thing you remember about that because Goliath was a giant. Remember that? You remember where the giants came from? Genesis 6. There were giants before the flood and after the flood. There's a re we'll talk about that in a minute. There's a reason for that. The Philistines, the, the, in, the, in the second century A.D., the Roman Empire, when they finally took all the Jews out of the land. You know the story about Masada and all that. When they finally got rid of all of them, the Roman emperor renamed the land of Israel Palestine, Palestinia. That's the Latin version, the Latin way of saying Philistines. He literally named the land after the Philistines because he hated Israel so bad. The Philistines hated, look at what verse 20, what verse 15 says. Thus saith the Lord God, because of the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it, Israel, for the old hatred. There is a hatred that both the, the, the relatives of Israel and the Gentile nations have for Israel. If you look at chapter 35, Ezekiel 35. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. Verse number five. Because thou hast a, underline it, perpetual hatred and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Not only is there an old hatred, that old hatred from, from, from time is perpetual all through history. Can you think about any other nation? Can you think of any reason that a nation that doesn't have a land or a national identity that they can say, that's my homeland, should be so hated through all of history? as the nation Israel has been. There's a reason for it, but can you, can you imagine? Can you name another nation that's just been hated all through history? Even when they don't have a land. They took it, get it taken away from them, God scatters them, and yet that perpetual hatred even still exists today and has through all of history. It's an ancient hatred. It's a perpetual hatred. It all revolves around jealousy over the Abrahamic covenant. What Israel's relatives were jealous of, what the Gentiles were angry about, is that God chose that one nation to be his nation. Now you have to understand, that goes way back. Matt was talking about it earlier. Go, go back with me. I'll just do it real quick. Deuteronomy 32. If you get Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now we're going to go back in, in, in your thinking to where Matt had you earlier in Genesis 11. I'm not going to go back to those verses. I'll just recite them again for you and bring them to your memory. He, he went through them very clearly. Deuteronomy 32. This, this is the song of Moses. I, I call it Israel's national anthem. And it's a song that Moses taught Israel that covers the whole of their history from the beginning to the end. Verse number six, verse number seven, Deuteronomy 32, seven. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee. Notice, it's the fathers that are supposed to teach their kids this information. The elders, the grandfathers, and the great-grandfathers, this is to be a family understanding. 
And when you're young, you don't understand it, go ask your daddy. And he'll tell you about this. Remember the days of old. Remember our history. Now what days of old is he talking about? When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. Now take that term Most High. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 14 and Genesis chapter number 14. The names of God in the Bible are very important. They're significant. In my home, if my wife calls me Richard, I know I'm in trouble. Because she doesn't call me Richard unless I'm in trouble. She calls me Ricky or Sweetheart or some other names like that. But if, 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 if I'm Richard, I'm, there's a meaning attached to that. And if I'm Charles Richard, I look for the door to get out of the house. <laughs> I'm in big trouble. So Nate, you understand how names can have significance. The Most High God is a very special name for, for God. Isaiah chapter 14, Lucifer, verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Now, Lucifer is the name of Satan before he became Satan. How thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how thou cut down to the ground, which is weak in the nations. Notice his attack is on the nations. For thou hast said, here's his original plan, in thine heart I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit, uh, I'll exalt my throne. He's part of the governmental structure of the heavens. Okay. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. There is a place in the universe, Job chapter 1, when, they, when the sons of God came to present themselves before God and Satan came with them. They, weren't, they didn't go into the third heaven. Satan doesn't go up there. There's a, there's a place. It's called the mount of the congregation. Psalm, Psalm 82 verse 1, when God sits and, and, and gathers the congregation, these angelic authorities in the heavens that are in charge of ruling and reigning, the watchers, the people that, that the heavens are organized just like the earth is. And Satan says, I'm going to, I want, I want all creation to be accountable to me. Verse 15, 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like who? The most high. I want to be the one that the whole universe, heaven and earth is accountable to. Because the, the title of God is most high He's the one that it reigns over everything in the government of the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 14, when Abraham and, and meets uh, Melchizedek, he says to him in, in, in Genesis 14, verse number 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem. And by the way, that word Salem, put Jehovah Jer, J-E-R in front of it, and you have Jeruth Salem. Here's the first time that city shows up, God's city. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was a priest of the Most High God. And he blessed and said, blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of, of the Most High God, comma. Now here's a description and a positive that describes who the Most High God is. Possessor of heaven and earth. The one who possesses all authority in the government of the heavens and the earth is the Most High. That's, when you read that, that's who you're talking about. We're talking about running the government of the heaven and the earth. So you go back to Deuteronomy 32. When the Most High, when the, run, when the one who decides who runs things, divided to the nations their inheritance. Now that's what happened in Genesis chapter 9, 10, and 11. God divides to the Gentiles. Genesis... Uh, chapter 11 explains why he did it, the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was, Babel was established by, uh, by Nimrod in chapter 10. And he's the kingdom of Babylon and the plain of Shinar. You have the city and you have the tower. You've got a religious system. You've got a government and a religious system to operate. Revelation chapter 17 talks about Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of, uh, of harlots and abominations in the earth. It's the city that reigns over the kings of the earth. 
the system that has reigned over the governments of the, of the world, the Gentile world, from Genesis 11 all the way to the Antichrist, who's a personification of it in the last days, is that Baal worship. This angelic rebellion that takes place. And at that time, what God does is he, Acts 14, here's Paul's worldview. Hold, hold your hand and come back to Acts 14. Matt read you Acts 17. Paul's understanding of this matches what, what Moses. Acts 14, he's talking to the, to the, 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 the idol worshipers in Lystra. Verse 11, when the, when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices and said, saying in the speech of the Lyconians, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. These are pagan people worshiping the gods of the nations. And Paul says, don't do that. That's not what's happening. Verse 15, sirs, why do you these things? We are... We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. What vanities? Worshiping these gods, you're worshiping vanities. What's that? Romans chapter 1. I'll flip over there and read it because I misquoted for you. When you one of the things you do when you get old, you begin to lose your mind. All you young people laugh, you don't understand that, but just, just wait. <laughs> it's coming. Romans 1, verse 21, because that when they, talking about the nations, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations. That's what a vanity is. It's a vain, empty, worthless thinking process. Leaves God out, don't do it your way. Professing themselves to be, they became, their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. They developed a religious system without God's truth. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. When it talks about these vanities, worshiping these, these fallen gods, Paul said, that's, that's, that's worthless Nonsense. Then go back to Acts 14. Turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and all things that are therein. Now watch verse 7, 16. Who in time past <laughs> killed a fly. Who in time past suffered all, th all nations to walk in their own ways. What happens right back here is, the, is at the Tower of Babel and the, and the things going on back there is God literally allowed the nations to walk in their own ways. You don't want me, do it your way. Romans 1.24, he says he gave them up. He gave them up. He gave them over to a reprobate mind. You, wanna, you don't want me, you go your way. And he literally turned the nations over to the gods in the angelic rebellion that they preferred, they didn't want him, have them. Deuteronomy 32, verse number eight. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, that's what he did at, at Babel, separate. A nation in Genesis 10, there's 70 of them, is made up of borders, language, and culture. That's how you define a nation. They have a land where they have borders, are definable borders, a language that separates, gathers the right people into that, and then you develop a culture from that. Matt talking about marriage and family. God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful. First they were married. You don't be fruitful until you get married. Be fruitful and multiply. Have kids and let them have kids. And replace, you're developing a culture. And we have cultures. They did that. Borders, language, and cultures. He divided the nation, set the bounds of the habitations. He did it. Matt read you the passage, Acts 17. So that, happily, they might find, find the Lord. You know what borders do? 
if you live, a, you live, a, you have a border, and your country goes bad, you cross over the border to the other side, and you get out of the badness. It confines things and pro provides protection. You can keep out badness from coming in. Borders provide uh, protection, so the happy might seek after the Lord. Anyway. He divided the separated sons of Adam and set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So he divides up the nations. You go in your own way. For the Lord's portion. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm going to have me a nation. It's his people. Jacob is a lot of his inheritance. So the Lord let the Gentiles go. Look, look back. At, look at chapter 20. You're in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and chapter 26. Just, just two real quick verses. The gods of the nations are not God. The gods of the nations are part of the satanic policy of evil. They're the false gods. You get Deuteronomy 4? I look at chapter 10 verse, in first. I don't, I don't have any notes. I'm just doing this out of my mind. So as it comes to my mind, I'll share them to you. <laughs> you know what that is? That's the thing I have to use to read my notes. Wow, I can see it now. That's a magnifier. When you get old, you, you put one of these in every, every pocket, my briefcase, every desk, every place that I study, I have one of those. And so you can get big ones. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter... 10, verse 15, only the Lord, Jehovah, had delight in thy fathers to love them. He chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this, this day. The reason when I drew that chart, I put Israel up there and the, the nations down here, when he separated them away, he put his people above all people. He let these people down here. Now, verse 17. The Lord, your God, Israel, is the God of gods and Lord of lords. Big G of the little G's. That's who Israel's God is. The Gentiles down here, they got the little G's. Israel's got the big G. And you know what, you know what the people down here with the little G's don't like? They don't like them having the big G. You know who the big G is? That's Jehovah, the Lord, your God. Jehovah, your Elohim. Is God. Big G of all the little G's. Elohim, God. Top ruler. Big dog. Lord of lords. Head of the spiritual, head of the political government, heaven and earth. Israel's God is the God of gods. These guys down here got their gods, and God turned them over to it. Look, look at chapter 4. He warns them about this. Chapter 4, verse 19. Lest thou shalt lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and he's warning Israel, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, and even all the host of heaven, I shall be driven to worship them. Who are the host of heaven? You remember Luke chapter 2? The angels appeared, and all the hosts of heaven with them. We're talking about the angel angelic host. You're going to worship all these gods that come down to men in Acts 14. And are driven to worship them and to serve them. Now watch, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations, unto the whole heaven. God literally took the, 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 these gods and here, you, that one's yours, that one's yours, that one's yours, that one's yours. You prefer him to me, here you have the... And he literally took the nations and put them under the authority of these gods, these angelic hosts, these rebels. Deuteronomy 26, there, there's a reference to it like that. It, this is the way they thought. This is what they understood was going on in, 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 in the angelic conflict. There's a, there's a thing going on in the world, in the Gentile world, behind the scenes in the Gentile world, 
where the world and the, and, and the nations of the Gentiles are being run and controlled by these spiritual rebe rebels. Genesis chapter 29, verse 25. The men shall say, Because thou hast forsaken the covenant of the Lord thy God, the Lord God of thy fathers, which, made, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. You remember what he did when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt? Hold your hand there and look at Exodus chapter 12. This is all introduction, by the way. My grandson said, don't go past lunch. <laughs> he doesn't know lunch is late. Exodus 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt both men and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. You know why there were ten plagues? Because God was executing. He told Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And then he says, but wait a minute, I got something to do first. This delay principles all through this was proven. I'm going to bring them out, but wait a minute, I got something to do first. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge all the gods of Egypt. I'm going to show them. Their gods aren't anything. Your God is, a, is the big God. He's the big G. And every one of those plagues was aimed at one of the gods of Egypt, and he destroyed it. And he executed judgment on the gods of the Gentiles. And when he brought Israel out of, out of Israel out of Egypt and made them a nation, he declared to the nations, I'm the big God, and you got the little guys. And these are my people. That's my nation. And you want to see what it's like to be a nation that has me as your God? Watch them. I'm going to, I'm going to show them how to organize. I'm going to show them how to function. I'm going to show them, how to, and I'm going to be their God. They're my portion. And you know why these guys down here hate that? Hate because that's the big G's guys, and we aren't. There's a jealousy over the covenant God made with Israel. You remember that thing in Genesis chapter 12? I'm going to make you, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to bless you. All the covenants of God, it's called the eternal covenant in Isaiah and Ezekiel because it's the basis of everything. It's the basis of the Palestinian covenant, the basis of the Davidic covenant, the basis of the new covenant. It's the basis of everything God does in redeeming the earth. I'm going to make Israel, give them a land. Zechariah 12 says, I'm going to put you back into your place. That's not America. That's not Europe. Jerusalem. Your place, Jerusalem. Zechariah chapter 12. That land belongs to them. I will make you a great nation. The seed. And that's really the issue because the seed goes back to Genesis 3. The seed of the woman. Becomes the seed of Abraham. Who's that? That's the Redeemer. And the angelic conflict is, I gotta get, I'm gonna contempt, I'm gonna stop the seed. So the big G says, I'm gonna have a people, and I'm gonna have a land, I'm gonna have a nation, and I'm gonna have a redeemer, and he's gonna bring it all back under my authority. And the little G's down here say, No, no, we want to, we want, we want to be the ones that do it. And that hatred, that spiritual conflict between the seed line, just try to destroy. That's where, and it's an old hatred. It starts in Genesis 16, if you want to see it. It's fascinating. This jealousy, listen, they were excited to see Israel go, not just because Israel was going, because they're thinking, our God, there's this war between the God of Israel, the big G God, and our gods, and our gods, Hey, he's lost because he said he's going to have a nation and a land and, a, and bless them. There's a wonderful verse in Isaiah 49 where the Lord and Satan have a conversation. And the Lord says, I'm going to do all this with my people. And Satan says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Let me ask you a question. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty? And the lawful captive set free. Don't you know I'm holding them captive? And they are my lawful captive? Think about that. 
Satan says to God, you gave him the law, and you said, you keep the law, I'll bless you. You break the law, I'll curse you. And I provoked him into breaking the law. So that belonged to me. You can't bless them because your law says you can't do it. I hold them captive because your law, Jehovah, says they're guilty. I got you. Checkmate. The Lord said, no, that's not the And he finishes, I said, 49, I said, yes, I can. And Satan said, no, you can't. And the Lord said, yes, I can. And the Lord said, no, you can't. And the Lord said, Yes, I can. And Satan said, no, you can't. And the Lord said, want to bet? <laughs> Chapter 50, he says, who's my adversary? Who thinks he can beat me? Come on, step up. Get close. Take your best shot. And you know what that turns out to be? That turns out to be Calvary. And the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary does something that nobody, the wise, the one who's wiser than Daniel, couldn't figure it out. He took the wise in his own craftiness by doing something nobody ever thought about doing. And Paul says, had Satan known what God was going to do through the cross, he wouldn't have crucified Christ because it's the thing that undid everything he's doing. How can he take the lawful captive and deliver them by delivering them from the law itself? by being the sacrifice for them. He said, whoa. Now don't you think when the adversary had that revelation made known, can you understand why he hates you so bad? He hates what we do. Because it demonstrates the folly and the foolishness of his wisdom above everything else. In Genesis chapter 16, when Abraham, God said, your seed, I'm going to use your seed to bless the nations. And Abraham didn't have a kid. And he's getting older. And his wife says, it's got to be you. And I'll prove it. Take Hagar. She goes into Hagar, and you know what? She gets pregnant. Hello, it's not, it's not, Sarah, it's not Abraham, it's Sarah. She's the barren one. She's the problem. In Genesis 6, verse 4, it says, He went out into Hagar, 16, 4, and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Hagar knew what the Abrahamic covenant was. Hagar knew, everybody knew what the promise was. I mean, Genesis 14, when Lot gets taken, they go get Abraham to come and get him. Now, Kazedek goes out and blesses him. They know. What's going on? And Hagar sees that. And what does bless her? What does she do? She says, All right, I'm gonna be the mom. I'm gonna be the, the one. She knows what the Abrahamic, she knows it's gonna be a great nation. She knows about the land, she knows about the blessing. And she despises Sarah because now it's gonna be me. And then she gets the bad news. It's not gonna be you. It's not gonna be your descendant. And now, it isn't just despising Sarah. Now she's despising Abraham. Abraham prays, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. You know, you know what the Muslims do? They take Ishmael and put him in first place. So the conflict with Islam goes all the way back here to Hagar. If you come over to chapter 21... Isaac grows, verse 8, the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day when Isaac was, was weaned, and Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born to Abraham. She's not praising God. She's mocking. She didn't appreciate what's going on. She's mad about it. There's a hatred. There's an animosity an attitude of ill will that comes up. And you go all the way on down through that. You've got to verse 21, verse 20, God, God was with the lad and he grew. God makes some promises uh, about what he's going to do to her, but it doesn't make any difference. 
Verse 21, he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Now, Hagar was an Egyptian. Now they go down, and, and they literally take that animosity and spread the thing down into, they have a lot of descendants. You'll find them called the Hagarites, Hagarines. And they spread that animosity all over the world. Now, you, if you come over to chapter 27, when Ishmael, when Isaac, rather, is going to pass on the Abrahamic blessing to his boys, you remember what 20, Genesis 25, verse 23, when, when Isaac has his kids with Rebekah, Genesis 25, 23, the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. <clears throat> the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So what does God say? Esau is going to serve Jacob. Who said that? God said that. He said that before they're born. That's my plan. That's the, that's the way it's going to work. Now, there's a, there's a principle in that about the, the second and so forth, but that's, that's, that's the, 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 so they know that. So when it comes time to pass the blessing, and by the way, at the end of that chapter is the great story about Esau sells his birthright. Verse number 30, 31, Jacob said, sell me thy, th today thy birthright, this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point of death, and what profiteth shall this birthright be to me? Jacob swear, said, Swear unto me this day, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. But when it came time to pass it on, you remember the, the shenanigans. If, if Jacob and his mom had just trusted God and not, not themselves, they're going to do it for God. Things would have been a little different. But after it happens, chapter 27, verse number 34, when Esau heard the, the words of his father, he cried with, with great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even O uh, me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety and had taken away thy blessing. God, he, didn't, he didn't steal anything. God gave it to him. Had anybody guys been going by what God said, they'd have known what to do. But they're, they're totally in the flesh. And he said, is, not his, uh, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. No, he didn't. You sold it to him. You wanted that, that bowl of red beans. That's why it's called Edom, red. And now he's taken away my birthright. No, he didn't. God gave it to him. Now he's taken away the bless, my blessing. No, no, no. God did that. Verse 37, Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I made him thy, thy Lord, and all thy brethren have I given to him for servants. He gave him the Abrahamic blessing. Now come down to verse 30, 41. Esau hated Jacob. Why? Because of the blessing. The jealousy over that Abrahamic blessing and the hatred, the old hatred started against Israel and the seed of, uh, uh, of Israel back here and it's all jealousy over that Abrahamic covenant. And with, it starts with Isaac, but here with, with, with Esau, it becomes not just old, but it becomes perpetual. Because when you come over into, into the Minor Prophets, you find Esau hating Jacob over in the last days because of this. So that, that ancient hatred. So what's going on out there in the world, whether it's the descendants of, of Israel, or is the Gentiles. There's this angelic conflict that's going on, and these guys down here, the little G's, Paul says, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost whom the what? God of this world. 
little Jesus, the blind and the mind. You know who controls the minds of the world out there? Who controls the government system, the financial system, the educational system, all the things going on? It's the little G's. They don't want to give up control. Now, one day Jesus Christ is going to come. He's the big G. He'll come back and set all this stuff, you know, rescue it and set it all back in, in, in place. But right now, he's doing something different. Right now what he's doing is he's forming the church, the body of Christ. Right now he's, he's got a, a different plan a, a, and, and a di different purpose. Come back with me to Acts chapter 17. I'm going to quit. This is where Matt had you earlier. This is literally Paul's view of all this stuff. Acts chapter 17. This is a great passage. Verse 15. They, 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 they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. Athens is the center of the Greek Empire. Back in the, in the dark ages when I was in college, uh, the head of the English department, Dr. Thomas, he spent three years trying to, teach me, trying to convince me Jesus Christ was a, was a sinner. And I didn't know, when I started that out, I didn't understand the Bible version issue. I was using an American Standard Version because Dr. Roy Beeman from New Orleans Seminary told me it was the best. My uncle said it was the best. They said use the King James Bible when you preach to people because that's what everybody's got, but the ASV is the best. And I was studying, I wanted the best. So I was the first person I ever introduced to Christ out of that ASV. First time I ever preached on street corners out of that ASV. I preached in the rest commission out of that ASV. That's what, what I use. And Dr. Thomas, he said, you know, Jesus is a sinner. And I said, no, no, no. And he, says, the Bi he said, the Bible's got mistakes in it. I said, no, no, no. He showed me Mark 1, 2. In their Bible, that ASV, all the new Bibles, it says, as it's written in Malachi. I'm sorry, sorry, as it's written in Isaiah. I'm sorry. And then it quotes Malachi. And he said, see, if Mark wrote, it's written in Isaiah, and he quotes Malachi, he didn't, ha he didn't have all his ducks in a row. And I said, that is a mistake. And I looked at three different Bibles and they all said the same thing. I didn't look at a King James because it didn't have one. King James Bible says, as written in the prophets. Mal quotes Malachi and Isaiah. Then he says, over here in Luke chapter two, in my ASV, he used the RSV. In Luke chapter two, when Mary goes on the eighth day to have him circumcised, it was for their purification. That means she thought her baby was needed purifying. She didn't think he was sinless. Your Bible says for her purification, according to Leviticus 12. And I was I struggled with that. And there's a dear friend sat me down and wept over me, having that ASV. And literally cried over over me. We'd have meetings together, and and finally began to show me these things. And I said, "Wow!" I'm about to show Dr. Thomas. He said, "I don't believe that kind of stuff. That's all ancient. Nobody believes that. The real scholars say this." And I said, "You know, I don't think quite as much of the real scholars anymore." He thought that the the Athenians, the Greeks, were the greatest things going. Modern education, European, the world, world education, Euro, Europe, and American education system is built on the Greeks, the Greek philosophy. Now, there were some great philosophers, great things. Aristotle, Plato, Euripides, Socrates, you know, you know where they got their information? Everything they know, everything they said that was new came out of the book of Ecclesiastes. Every philosopher in human history from the, from the, from the old world back here, back then, Everything they say, you can find the book of Ecclesiastes. If they had the book of Ecclesiastes on the table in front of them when they said the things that they did. Aristotle's golden means, Ecclesiastes, all that stuff. They don't give credit to where they got it from, but when you study your Bible, you find out where they got it from because they weren't going to give the big G God credit. They're going to give a little G God credit because they got the credit for this guy, this stuff. I confess, I came out of the education system a little jaded in favor of a King James Bible. And when people in the grace movement wanted to say, well, you know, it's not really the best, it got my hackles up. I confess, 
I got my back up about it because I had been on both sides of the thing and found out one side was wrong. And I didn't want to go back to the other side. And I don't want anybody I taught to think they ought to go back to the other side. Don't you ever think you don't have God's word in your language, in your hand, when you hold a King James Bible. It, he said, well, it's all in the Greek. I know it's in the Greek. It can, be in, it can be in any language. It's designed to be in every language. But you don't speak every language. My wife uh, works with our daughter-in-law in, in kindergarten. And they got this one little boy, little five-year-old boy, and he, he's Polish. And he, they speak Polish at home. They don't speak English at home. So when he comes to kindergarten, he can't speak English when they start. But you guys don't know my wife. Any five-year-old is going to love my wife, and she's going to love them. She loves children. The children love her. It's just natural. And this little boy, at we were at, at, at Noah's eighth grade graduation the other day, and he was making eyes at my wife across the room. And after it was over, he came over. He old Miss Jordan, and he's just jabbering all his little head off. I can understand a word he's saying. <laughs> and I told him, can he talk? She said, oh, that's all Polish. <laughs> he speaks Polish. Every language God's designed his word to be in. But if you don't speak every language, what difference is it to you? It's in your language, too. You understand? That's the issue. Not that it can, it can be in all, but it is in yours. Now, I'm worried about the rest of them. I'm worried about me because I hardly speak English as it is. Anyway, I'm sorry. That was all my aggravation. The Athenians just get me stirred up. <laughs> because these guys, Paul's, Paul's, he's right there. And the education system, and listen, it's the, the whole, you know. <laughs> verse 16. Now, while Paul waited at Athens, here I am, his spirit, he was his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics, now that's two completely different sides of, of Greek philosophy, encountered him and said, what will this babbler say? And they have a conversation. Verse 21, for all the Athenians and the strangers well, which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something, some new thing. Got to hear the gossip, the latest news. You know one of the greatest things that happened for you is for you to turn your television off Quit watching Fox News. Quit watching MSNBC. Quit watching CBS. You say, I got to know what's going on. No, you don't need to know what's going on. It's all about the nonsense anyway. If you took your time that you spend watching that stupid boob tube and trying to suck in all that stupid, listen, all that propaganda you watch is only there to stir you up to keep you watching so they can sell advertising and take money to the bank. It's got nothing to do with trying to tell you anything that, that, that relates to truth and accuracy. And I don't care either side you're on, left, right, middle, up, down, whatever side you want to be on. It has nothing to do with anything that is actually true. And it doesn't make any difference to you anyway. If you turn that thing off, got your Bible out, if you read three chapters a day of Paul's epistles, you'd read them through in 28 days. Think of what would the difference would make in your life if you read Paul's epistles through every month, you know what would happen? I can tell you this because people tell me this. They'll read it every month, every month for six months, and then all of a sudden they're reading it twice a month because they got so interested in it that three chapters didn't do. You can read three chapters in about five minutes. Well, I was watching TV longer than that. Take 30 minutes. Just turn that stupid stuff off and watch something happen in your life that will make a difference forever. Mr. It'll make a difference in the way you treat your wife. Now she's going to make you do it. <laughs> it'll help her dealing with you. It'll change the attitude of your children. You think this stuff gets into people just by osmosis, just by being around it. It doesn't. It gets, it, it gets in you. Paul says, Ephesians chapter 3,
don't get COVID. Whereby, I could come to the first word. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. You're not going to understand this stuff until you read your Bible. Listen to the tapes. Reading books about the Bible doesn't do it. It can help. It's what teachers are for. But you got to read your book and believe what you read. Okay, I'm through with that. Here's what he does in Acts 7, 17. All these airheads. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. Now that's a great way to start, isn't it? Everybody says you need to be kind and, you know, make contact. He gets worse. For I passed by and behold your devotions, and I found uh, 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 an altar under this, with this inscription, To the unknown God. Whom you therefore ignorantly worship, I declare unto you. All right, you guys, you're a bunch of superstitious ignoramuses. Let me tell you the truth. He's talking to the intelligentsia of the Western world. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth, in the temple, not, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. That makes sense. Neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell upon all the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitations. That's Genesis, Matt went over that. That they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after him and find him. Though it be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain of your own poets have, have, have said. For we are all his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art, man's devices. I mean, common sense would tell you that. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. When they wanted to go in their own way, have your way. But now, Commandeth all men to do what? Repent. Change your mind. Don't think that way anymore. Now, he said, I'm not, I'm not winking at it. Because he that appointed, he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. If the resurrection is true, folks, everything's going to be okay. And when I say if, I don't mean maybe it will, maybe it didn't. I mean since it's true. Everything's going to be right. And when they heard these, the, the, you know, the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we will hear thee again. Don't expect everybody to believe what you said when you preach the gospel to them. Now that's how Paul thought about it. Paul didn't think he was going to have a mega church. He didn't think everybody was going to love what he said. He said, this is the truth, and some people don't like it. They're going to mock it. And some people are going to say, well, they're just going to dismiss you. So Paul departed from among them. He didn't get upset. He didn't get mad. He said, I just got, I got somewhere else to preach. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. You know what happens when you preach the gospel? Some people are going to mock. Some people aren't going to listen. And some people are. Some people don't believe it. You know why? Because God's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the mighty. People like you and me, dumb enough to believe what God said, willing to say what God says is right, what I'm saying doesn't really matter. He's the creator, I'm the creature. He doesn't need what I can provide for him. He gave me what I had to give him. Paul's view of the world is that what God's doing today, not, not trying to bring in a kingdom. He's not trying to set this angelic conflict right. He's forming a body of believers, taking 
men, women, boys, girls, Jews, Gentiles, bond the trade, whoever they are. Putting you on a body of believers called the church, the body of Christ, where there's no Jew, Gentile, bond, free, male, female status. It's always fascinating to me. People, Christendom, 97% of Christians today think they're Israel, the spiritual Israel. He puts you in the body of Christ where there's no Jew or Gentile status. If, it, if there's no Jewish status or Gentile status in the body of Christ, how did he make you a spiritual Jew? Because there's nobody in the body of Christ in that status. You're the one new man. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're something that God never told anybody he's going to create, but he's created it because he planned it before the foundation of the world. We know about it now. He kept it secret, but it's revealed. The secret's out, and that's who you are. Brother, last night talked about understand who you are in Christ. You need to know who God's made you in his son. But listen, you need to know what's going on in the world out there. There's a conflict between the big G and the little G's. And the big G's going to win in the end. But just like he told Moses, let my people go. But wait, before you do, I want to whack these guys real good. And demonstrate that I am. You remember in Joshua chapter 2, when the, seven, the spies went into to Jericho? You remember Rahab, the harlot? She said, we heard what God did to the gods of the, your God, did to the gods of Egypt 40 years ago. And we've been waiting for you to come. We've been scared to death. You're going to come clean our plow too. You've been walking around, around the wilderness out there. Now you're coming. She said, we know, I know, that your God is the God of gods because I saw what he did to the Egyptians. I say, glory to God. That's why in James chapter 2, it's not just Abraham, but it's Rahab that's used in James' illustration for the little flock. What God's doing today, forming the body of Christ, he's demonstrating it to make a difference. How, how low you get down here, he can take you and make you a part of something that's going to use for eternity. Appreciate who you are in Christ. Appreciate who God's made you. Understand, in your Bible, that there's more going on than just you and me. There's this tremendous spiritual activity going on. You're a part of it as a member of the body of Christ. Live your life not trying to, be, not trying to solve problems that aren't going to be solved till Christ comes back. Live your life doing what God's doing today. Make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery? That doesn't mean understand the doctrine. That means put it on display so they can see a life filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ and the glory and praise of God. Okay? Praise the Lord. Y'all look hungry, so I guess we go, go to lunch, right? Before we do that, we're gonna, we need to spit. <laughs> Father, we thank you this afternoon for your love and your grace. We thank you for your word. I thank you for these people that are willing to come spend it themselves and the resources that come for a weekend like this and uh, understand the value, spiritual value, the eternal value uh, for them, for their families. We pray for them. We pray, we pray for the ministries that we have together till you come for us. And we thank you for the privilege of it in Christ's name.